Okay, so we're starting today with, and I'm hoping to get into this other one just a little bit, but we're going to start with the Devedeck article, and then hopefully we will get into, and the Devedeck article is the, the body political embodiment of work in the era of human enhancement. And then I'm hoping to get into the article by Hermita, uh, Horizontal Surveillance, Mobile Communication, and Social Networking Sites. Hold on, I'm gonna update my, because quite a few guys came in after I sat down. Oh. I'm gonna update my roster thing. To talking about the Devedek article, uh, there's a couple things we're going to get into. One, well, I'm going to start with this. So I'm going to have you guys turn to page 57. And so there's this second paragraph which starts on page 57 and ends on page 58. You guys see where I'm at? So, just, yeah. Oh, this is the Devedec, D-E-V-E-D-E-C. Yep. With all the, uh, with all the accent marks on it. Yeah. So, um, and so yeah, we're on page 57. So, I'm just gonna have you guys, what I want you to do is I want you to scan over this and tell me the phrases you don't know what they mean. And then, and then we'll start from there. Can you turn the page again? 57. And then I'll carry it over onto page 58. There's three in particular I'm looking for, but people find more. Awesome. Be polite or wait. Just, just holler them out when you hit them. Mile power. Yes, that's that's a particularly significant one. Bio power. What else? I'm just looking for words. Words are phrases that you don't know what they mean. Biocracy. Biocracy, yeah. 
That's a good line. The last one I was kind of hope, thinking we would get to was immaterial labor. This paragraph is, if you didn't catch this when you were reading it, it's kind of like the, the operative paragraph of of our article. Uh, so, does anybody want to take a stab at any of these from, you know, to some degree, like you read an entire, uh, entire article on biopower. Uh, <laughs> this one's pretty close to some things that we've talked about before. We can start there. Does anybody know what that, like the exploitation of capitalist commodification might mean? Do you guys remember, we talked about commodification, I think, didn't we? So commodification is the process where we take things that aren't commo commodities and turn them into commodities, right? So if you think back when we were talking about global inequality, uh, we were talking about, we did, did we talk about structural adjustment in here at all? We, we have talked about liberalism, right? You guys remember talking about liberalism? So liberalism could also be talked about as as commodification. So what you're doing is you're taking things that previously people didn't make money off of, and then you turn them into things that produce money, right? So they're written everyday sort of things in people's lives, and then they become commodities, right? Uh, so part, part of what's being talked about in this article is to some degree the commodification of our bodies. Right? Our bodies and our minds are increasingly things that are commodities. And we can even think about like the next article that we're going to read talking about surveillance. Like surveillance through social media is in a lot of ways is an example of our minds being rendered into a commodity where before they were not, right? So that would be the process. This is normal Marxist language. Like Marxists like to talk about the commodification of human labor, the commodification of natural resources, the commodification of X, Y, and Z. Okay. I wasn't expecting to talk about that one, but yeah, so that's, that's actually a very common catchphrase. You'll actually, if you move on in the humanities, social sciences, art criticism, you'll then come across those things again. Okay. Anyone want to take a stab at another one? What about the one right above that? Techno-scientific. Techno -scientific. What, uh, Really, just two words you already know slammed together. <clears throat> you know, uh, I think I told you guys before that I used to at least be able to read German. And in German, they just will take, take nouns and slam them together to make new nouns. So you can just take any two nouns and then turn them into a new word by putting them into the same word. Academics do this in English as well. So they'll just take, like, and so a lot of like times when you're going through your articles, you'll notice like they'll just put a dash between things, but it'll all be one word. So essentially what they're trying to capture is that these two things can be thought of conceptually together. That's all that's happening right there. So it's not even, that's not even like necessarily like a common phrase per se in academia, but it, it, it does, so what, what two words do you think they're doing there? Technology and scientific. Technology and scientific. So like, uh, they, yeah, so essentially he's, that, that, that phrase is just a good example of that. I'm going to actually probably take that one out, but, but that's essentially what's happening there. OK. These two, so immaterial labor, and cognitive capitalism are interrelated. These are actually, right there are authors using two terms for the same thing. He uses it both throughout the article. Um, think about that. Let's start with immaterial labor. 
So what would be the opposite of immaterial labor? Material labor. What do you think you would do with material labor? Physically do something? Yeah, you'd make things, right? So what do you think immaterial labor is? What's that? Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. And so if you want to talk about cognitive capitalism or immaterial labor, it, it's talking about, at least in the US and in, uh, in Western Europe, we see where primarily we've seen a shift away from making things, right, producing anything, to forms of labor that involve nothing but thinking, speaking, etc. So we kind of talked about that before. Uh, this is in a lot of ways another way of phrasing or thinking about uh, things like the shift to the service economy, right? So like in essence, like what's being pointed at with those terms is that you know we exist in cognitive capitalism. We exist in a form of labor where most of it's immaterial. So most of you, I'm guessing, anybody here like an art major or something? So probably none of us in here are gearing for jobs where you make anything, right? So you're probably talking about not doing material labor, right? You're talking about doing immaterial labor. You know, the hordes of people who move things around on spreadsheets, and that's how they, what they do to produce money, right? Okay. So that's what's being used with that term. Biopower. This is another term that, that gets thrown around in, in the article that's similar in structure. Can I catch up? Yeah. So it's just um, it's just talking about people with like people's bodies and minds like to do your work as opposed to um, thinking of like production as a thing that's done by well, that's more of these guys, right? So biopower is connected to, and I, what I was fishing for is, you see the, the term biopolitic thrown around a lot in here? And both of these terms are later terms by somebody we've already looked at and even talked about already this week once, which is power, right? So. Uh, so when we were talking about the prison and surveying ourselves, right, and watching each other, right, that sort of language also pops up in our, the article we're going to try to discuss for today as well, this idea of living in a society that's built like that panopticon prison. The, more, the later version of that that Foucault talks about is us policing our own bodies so that we're in a system where increasingly uh, even our bodies are sort of become subject to us constantly watching them, right? So the idea is this, it's, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like, what do you think about a lot when you eat food? Taste. What's that? The taste. You might think about the taste. Yeah, I think about the taste of the food I, I, I eat. What else? That's sort of like a trans-historical people taste their food and decide whether it's good or bad. What else? What's that? I think it looks good. If it looks good, once again, like I wonder if that's not more of a chance historical thing, like whether our food's attractive. What else do we think about when we eat food? Is it good for you? What's that? Is it good for me? Is it good for you? Right? And you can think about it too, like, like you think about whether it's good for you, has anybody here ever count calories before? Right? Um, does, do people look at the calories on the labels of food that you eat? I do. Like, I, I, a lot of people do, right? And so, like, you think about, like, for most of humanity, they have not paid attention to the calories that they made, right? But in modernity, we do. We think about, so we think about our food that we consume in a much different way, right? We think about it in a way, if you will, that's dealt with us policing our bodies, right? This is also interconnected with things like we get forced increasingly 
right? And thinking about how in this, so we can think about our disability, the disability article in this too, right? Thinking about health in terms of our own actions, right? Being the result of our own health. Um, and so that's kind of like the essence of biopolitic is that increasingly we become, we're forced into thinking about our bodies in a certain way and policing ourselves, right? Where before bodies for people were just the bodies that they lived in, right? They didn't think about them in this sort of rational, utilitarian way, right? That now we are, right? Does that make sense to people? Uh, another way I like to think about this, uh, has anybody ever had, to, had a form of insurance where you had to like, through your parents, where you had to like, the insurance company would come, take your blood pressure, draw blood, take your weight, measure your height, do a survey with you, and then the amount you had to pay for insurance adjusted on the basis of your answers. Have anybody ever had this? This is, so that's actually most insurance in America now is done this way. So essentially like, like if you answer the survey that you smoke or how much you drink is too high or like if anything, any of your measurements of your body get high, your cholesterol is too high or, you know, iron's too low, et cetera, et cetera, they start, they start increasing your insurance. Right? And the idea is, is then it sort of like forces people to take stock of, and then they offer you classes too, right? So like the insurance company will be like, do you want to take a class where you quit smoking? Do you want to take a class to lose weight? You know, and they'll provide that. But the idea is, is that then like, if you cost money to the insurance company, it falls back on your shoulders rather than theirs. You guys get how that's kind of like a form of biopolitic? Right? So like within like within like the surveying structures of our society, like these aren't just talking about outward actions and things that we do, like when we were talking about crime. They're talking about even down to the cellular makeup of your blood is something that you survey. And so that's the essence of the idea of biopolitics. Biocracy is very similar to that. So our author uses that term as well. Biocracy is kind of like, if you will, the sort of rationalism of it all, right? That sort of rational utilitarianism of it would be its biocracy, which is a play off of the word bureaucracy, which in sociology, when we use the bureaucracy, we mean rationalization, right? Uh, the things are rational, utility maximizing, right? Subject to numbers and accounting and things like that. Um, Okay, any questions about any of those terms? Or thoughts people have so far? So, this is how we often talk about, well, sans these, right? When it comes to biology, biocracy, right? These are all, or the commodification of our bodies. This is often how we talk about bodies in, in the literature on medicine, right? In sociology. What our, and so what our author's interested in is how a lot of times the, this literature is not particularly interested in how forms of work that are immaterial are policed still through our bodies. So it's basically like that we think of our minds and our bodies as separate things culturally has created kind of this weird blind spot that the studies of bodies have ignored the way in which, in this case, particularly capitalism forces a form of biopolitic on the people as a result of their jobs in immaterial labor. Everyone follow that? So that's kind of the, that's the story that is being set up. So then, after this follows, like in all of our other articles, right, literature review. And this literature review is going to start out looking at what are some of the ways that we've talked about bodies this way. And particularly, it's going to pull out two. At this point, it might be useful to throw in another term for you guys. I know it's a lot of terms today. And this term is the term post-humanism. Because our articles kind of arguing against the 
system of thought called post-humanism. And that's why there's this focus on human enhancement over here. Um, to think about post-humanism, I think a good, good way to get into it is to think about what is it that people, com so if any, have you ever noticed that older people often like to complain about anyone who's a millennial or younger and how they use cell phones? I love that you guys didn't even let me finish the sentence. <laughs> I'm just like, did you ever notice that older people like to complain about it? And you're like, uh-huh. <laughs> okay. What are the complaints about people using their cell phones? Yeah. Uh, one thing I, I hear a lot is like, you're not growing up, like getting your hands dirty, or playing in the mud, or you're just on your cell phone in your own little digital realm, not going out and being like a kid. Oh yeah, that's nice. I like that. So, so basically, no forms of physical play. I don't think I've gotten that one before, but yeah, I have heard, heard people say that. No forms of physical play, yeah. See, I only started getting harassed about using a cell phone when I was in my 20s. Because before that, they were flip phones, and the coolest ones were the smallest ones. <laughs> okay, what else? What else do people complain about? Talking about yeah, yeah, no face-to-face -face interaction. Sort of the death of face-to-face -face interaction. Often that's kind of tied in with this claim that like people are forgetting how to communicate, right? Various claims about forgetting. Which is kind of ironic, because what is texting? <laughs> I like to text with friends, right? Crack jokes, send emojis, gifts, whatever, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> and it's often like, like in some ways, like it's like a subtle form of communication because, like, you could be in a you could be at a business meeting and texting jokes to a friend from high school, right? It's kind of nice in a lot of ways if you think about it this way. Like, it allows you to choose who you communicate with. It also allows you to shut people out, right? Uh, that's sort of like, has anybody ever gotten their cell phone out when, when uh, you just didn't want to talk to somebody? Okay. And you're not actually doing anything on it, you just get it out so it looks like you're doing something, so they'll shut up. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Anyways, so what other things do people complain about when it comes to the sort of like technological use of cell phones? I mean, this is like constant like stream of like news articles and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Anybody you know, catch the stuff about memory that people will say? Yeah, yeah. Do you do you want to like? My mom tells me all the time. She's like, it's not going to do any good for you to play stare at the phones, like. When like trying to like learn a new concept, I think she's like trying to like, talk like harder. It's like it like goes really like I don't know what she was trying to get across. Yeah. Yeah, you essentially you're supposed to like it's supposed to hurt your ability to remember things. Why is that? Why why would cell phones hurt your ability to remember things? Um, you want to think about this? So that you can like depend on them. What's that? So that you can like depend on them. Yeah, exactly. Why do I need to remember things? I can just plan it in my planner. And then when it comes to concepts, like that's what Wikipedia is for, right? Like, like <laughs> I just can Google search it again if I need to find it. Um, so basically, if you want to understand post-humanism, post-humanism would take these kind of complaints, and their answer to them would be, so what? <laughs> right? Like, if I don't remember things as well, who cares? I have access to more, more memory than my brain could ever possibly hold. I'm still smarter than the smartest person without a cell phone in their hand. 
That would be the post-humanist response, right? Who cares if communication is changing as such that most of the communication I do is on my phone, right? Does it make sense? So basically, the post-humanism's response would be like, this kind of thing is basically overvaluing what it means to be human, right? But for post-humanists, they don't really care about being human, right? To them, it's sort of like, it's sort of like the human wasn't really that great to begin with. It's mostly people exploiting each other and trampling each other underfoot. Let's just give it up and merge with the machine. That's, uh, that's kind of the idea behind post-humanism. Let's just give it up and merge with the machine. Let's enhance ourselves with the use of technology and forget about trying to hold on to some sort of past human. The post-humanist like images of people that are things like cyborgs, right? Like a cyborg is a sort of like an idea, like, and there's a whole like, there's a feminist post-humanist by the name of Donna Haraway who wrote a book called The Cyborg Manifesto. And the whole idea of the cyborg manifesto is, is exactly this idea, right? It's like, like, why do we want to avoid including things like technology even inside of our own biological selves, right? Like, why is it that we're so afraid of that? Things, things that cross the divide between the material and the immaterial, between human beings and objects, like all these things are great. And let's just kind of like forget about this humanistic ideal of avoiding it and trying to remain, like hold on to some sort of past greatness. Does it make sense? Once again, our author is not going to really like this argument. We're going to see why. Okay, let's get into the lit review. So when it comes to enhancing human bodies, right, a lot of the post-humanist literature is focused on talking about, particularly about like bodily enhancement, is focused on the ways in which people have altered the bodies of athletes and altered the body of people in the military, soldiers, um, as well as these other sort of technological themes. So did anybody pick up some of these changes in this article? This starts on page 59 and runs through till 62. What are some of the things that, that, that I've done to enhance the existing human body? Yeah. Steroids. Yeah, yeah, so one, traditionally, how do we feel about steroids normally? How do you what? How do we feel about steroids? I mean, like, particularly for recreational use, not like, you know, like, last year I had dropped foot and I had to take steroids <laughs> um, to, uh, to stimulate nerve growth, right? Like, not like that, but like, you know, I take steroids because, I don't know, I want to get big and strong and be a better football player or whatever. Kind of like a cheat code. We cheat, cheat it like, yeah, like it's cheating, right? What do you think a post-humanist might feel about steroid use? Go for it. <laughs> Who said that? Yeah, go for it. In essence, yeah, a post-human response would be like, yeah, at least, at least we're experimenting with making human beings stronger and better. Like, there might be downsides to it biologically, but if people want to take that risk, why am I? Why? Why do I want to like intervene and sort of tell you not to do it? Right? Would be kind of the response, right? So if you wanted to think about it as like not using steroids would be holding on to some form of humanism that the natural human body should be the one competing. Um, did anybody catch this? While well, we're on the sports one. Oh, by the way, are you usually allowed to use steroids to uh, for sports, legally speaking? Did anybody catch some of the things that, what are some other things, did anybody know of any other things people do? These are also kind of unnatural sometimes. There's some milder things you can do that's legal. Maybe you ever see like the chemical supplements or like the protein shakes and stuff like that. Like in a lot of ways though, people often have negative attitudes towards those as well, but in a lot of ways those are also sort of enhancement things people use, right? 
Um, there's Dan and catch the gene doping thing. This is something kind of complicated and strange. Is that the, uh, the genetic element of cell capacity to enhance active performance? That What's that? So can you say that a little louder? Genetic elements or cells to enhance the athletic performance. Does anybody know what gene therapies do? Anybody here into medicine enough to have even heard of gene therapy? Gene therapy uses like genetic materials. Uh, and it's usually used for people with genetic conditions, right? And so you use genetic material to alter the, temporarily alter the DNA of the person, the patient, right? So it's like by taking in usually some form of stem cell, you alter the genes of the person, right, who's being treated. Uh, so these are usually for genetic disorders. If you guys think about in the news, there's been, there was something recently that the president, when he had COVID, took gene material. That was, that was a, what he was doing was he was using some, uh, he was using uh, uh, the same sort of stuff, right? Uh, he's using a genetic therapy to increase his immune system, which is something people have been talking about doing for COVID. Uh, it hasn't gotten FDA approval, right? But it's something that's probably gonna happen eventually. Um, but it's kind of interesting because, like, rather than taking a chemical pill, right, like, you're literally, like, alt temporarily altering your own DNA, um, which is kind of interesting. But there's been, uh, there's been at least talk about possibly doing this with athletes, athletes altering their DNA temporarily uh, rather than using steroids. And then there's also this, and this was something that got cited. I saw, I've seen this in uh, quite a few post-human stuff in recent years. Uh, the, did, did anybody hear about uh, uh, Oscar Pistorius? There's a discussion of this on page 68. He's an Olympic runner from South Africa. Um, and there was a big controversy because he has no legs. So he, his, uh, well, I should say he didn't have legs. Uh, but Oscar Pistorius, uh, you know, had no legs from the kneecaps down. Uh, and there was a lot of people trying to ban him from competing in the Olympics as a runner because they were claiming that his false legs gave him a strategic advantage over all the other runners. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of heard about that. Like, they like, didn't want him to compete because he thought he had like, an advantage over everybody. Yeah. Which, do you guys get the strangeness of that? Because, like, Traditionally, well, if you had no legs, what would we consider that? What's up? Table. Yeah, we can, yeah, actually, Oscar Pastorius started out in the Special Olympics as a runner, <laughs> right? Um, so you think about that, right? And, like, there's something really interesting that, like, because essentially he had a mechanical mechanism, right? Uh, connected to himself, it was treated as if, right, like, so going back to like in terms of an enhancement narrative, like have we got to the point, and this is how both why posthumans were so interested in Oscar Pistorius, have we gotten to the point where the, the human body can actually just be improved upon, right? So if you want to think about Oscar Pistorius in this sense as a cyborg, right, uh, in a Donna Haraway sense, it was taken as a very positive thing. Something very, very interesting to know. Okay, anybody can I see? Uh, anybody see and hear how? Um, what sort of things they've done to soldiers through the years? Oh, that was kind of weird how they gave uh, soldiers math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought that was interesting too. Yeah. <laughs> so, did, did did people catch that? You want to go into a little more detail? And said in like World War II, they, the the. Uh, the German and Japanese forces were given methamphetamine to enhance their performance. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, like, like, yeah. So basically, they're kept alive, right? And also, like, apparently, like, taking meth in heaven's fear, right? So you don't get afraid, and you're really awake and really active and hyper, right? So essentially, and we've experimented with microdosing LSD on soldiers and stuff like that as well. Um. So throughout the history, and actually like we continue to do experimentations very similar, uh, there's a discussion of a contemporary one where they're trying to stimulate brain waves in soldiers by electrocuting them. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, so we're not like severely electrocuting, but electrically stimulating externally the brains um, to create greater stimulation. Um, so, uh, yeah, talking about metabolically engineering, right? So, they're also talking about doing gene doping on soldiers, right? It's something that the military is at least researching, they haven't done. Um, the possibility of doing. So, these are sort of traditional ways that people have been looked at both posthumanism. It's also traditional ways that people have looked at basically like biopolitic, right? These weird things where, you know, to some degree, like if you want to think about a biopolitic in posthumanism, we're almost the same thing, right? Just viewing it all from opposite directions. Biopolitic looks at this as like an external form of control where the expectations on people have become so great that they have to, they're, they're being forced into actually like taking drugs and doing inhuman things. The posthumanist way of looking at it would be like, no, we're finally reaching beyond the human. We're, we're getting beyond like the biological organism we're born with. Okay, make sense? Cool. So then, lastly, he's going to take this and he's going to start applying it to those forms of immaterial labor. Uh, he starts doing this and... I think I passed it, sorry. Uh, right here. Um, wait, no. Ah, right here. He starts doing this on page, no, no, page 62. That was the end page of the other one. So on page 62, he starts doing this. And so they give several examples of people being sort of pushed into forms of human enhancement, right, uh, in sort of everyday work lives, right? It's something very different from the extremes of, of you know, super soldiers and doped up athletes. Does anybody, so, so did anybody catch up with any of these? Or people want to skim through it and see if they can find a couple examples that they give? <clears throat> yeah? Uh, the one really weird thing was that they said that sometimes older employees will get cosmetic surgery to look younger, so they won't take determination. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you're in a highly professional setting, you may have a vested interest in looking, continuing to look young. So in certain professions, cosmetic surgery is really common. Uh, High-end salespeople, lawyers, business people often get plastic surgery, um, you know, simply so that they are not perceived as being older and sort of cut, end up being cut out of work um, or even forced to retire. Um, so yeah, that's one way. Did, what uh, anybody notice any other ones through here? They had one where they would freeze a uh, woman's the ovaries so that way you could delay her motherhood, so they wouldn't interrupt her career. Yeah, so the, it's talking about there's been studies on companies. Um, Basically, like, so we talked about before, like, uh, in terms of uh, when we were talking about gender, right, that a lot of times companies are uh, wary of hiring women because they view them as essentially that they're going to eventually have children and either leave the company or they're going to have to give them a lot of time off. And so companies are increasingly providing freezing of people's eggs as a service. So that basically like you can then have a kid when it's convenient for the company in your career as opposed to before you essentially your biological clock runs out, right? So like here we get like to some degree work pressures, right? You want to think about this as biopolitics, both of these things have to do with aging, right? And so essentially providing ways of escaping aging, right, for practical reasons that are beneficial to the companies we belong to. Right? That's kind of, kind of what's being captured here. He gives another example of, of it, it forms of immaterial labor and human enhancement with the use of psychostimulants. You guys know what psychostimulants are? 
So psychostimulants. Uh, anybody here ever have to take drugs for ADHD or ADD? Those are psychostimulants. So uh, um, I'm not admitting this because I'm proud of it. But when I was in high school, I used to sell my ADHD medication a lot. Um, I didn't particularly like taking it. It made me feel wonky. It actually made me feel really stupid. Because like one thing is like, and this is exactly why you're hyper, and maybe you'll be like, oh, this is why he talks the way he does in front of the classroom. But like, your brain fires really rapidly when you're ADHD, right? Well, you take those drugs and they slow you down, and then I felt really stupid all the time, right? So like, uh, so like, I hated taking them. So basically, like, yeah, I would sell them to the rich kids in my school. You can make a huge mark off. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying that it's good, right? Like, I, 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 I legally sold drugs as a teenager is basically what I'm saying, but I could get like, I get like five bucks a pill. It was great. <laughs> it was like a three hundred percent markup. Um, why do people? Why? Why do you think rich kids would buy? Right. Psychostimulants from somebody who had them prescribed to them. Didn't they say like some college students would take it to help them like focus for tests or something? Yeah. If you don't if you don't need psychostimulants, it essentially gives you a lot of energy and it makes you super focused. Um, when I was in graduate school, a lot of graduate students regularly took Adderall. Um, so that they could work longer. Um, you know, did you have you, something else you wanted to ask or say? Does it make, so like, like, you could do this, right? And same thing with like, if psychostimulants have gotten more and more common in the workplaces as well. So more often people are you, resorting to the use of psychostimulants to get through their work lives. If you want to interpret that one way, right, you can interpret that in a post-human way of basically like, wow, isn't that great that people are like escaping the limitations of getting tired and not being able to focus when you're tired. But how else could you read that? Well, if you're not taking them, then it's just not good enough to be human anymore. It's like if you're not doing all these things to enhance your performance, then you're just a regular human and that's not good enough for employers anymore. Yeah, yeah. And I like the way you phrased that last part, right? It's not basically if you're human, it's not good enough for employers anymore. So like that's where we get into this more as a form of biopolitic or biocracy, right? Where even our, where the commodification of our of our immaterial labor comes in, right? Is that in essence like our lives have gotten so hectic and busy because of the expectations placed on us, uh, that we have to resort to the abuse of chemicals to actually achieve our work goals, right? It's kind of crazy. So what our author is essentially trying to do is he's trying to say, like, we've missed this entire blind spot, this entire moment of exploitation. And if we look at this, right, it creates a very different feeling than it does if we're talking about Oscar Pastorius with, uh, with artificial legs, right? Is human enhancement all it's cracked up to be? Or is it really just this thing we're pressured into so other people can eke even more money out of our bodies than they would be able to otherwise, right? Make sense? Any thoughts people have? On or on post-humanism as an idea, or reactions people want to share? No reactions. Has anyone ever even heard of the like post-human stuff before? Is that kind of new? I see some people nodding. Okay, so did you guys learn about it in other classes or just everyday life? I've just heard about like um, what's his name? Uh, in the Tour of France with Dopin, you got like ridicule for it with Lance. Lance Armstrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All the car knowledge. Yeah, yeah, and so that you get sort of the hostile sort of reaction to, yeah. Okay, cool. We have five minutes. I'm still going to try to 
get us at least started on the surveillance article. Okay. So how aware are people that you're being watched on there on the internet? 100%. <laughs> it's hard not to be, right? <laughs> so, uh, does any, anybody ever notice anything about ads on the internet? What, what do you notice? <laughs> How does that, I've noticed that too, like, to me that seems like, like, and I think, and this may sound really paranoid, but I don't think it is, right? That somebody actually uses the microphone on your phone to hear what you're saying and then advertise to you appropriately, right? I guess, like, like, I can't prove that that's true, right? So I'm not gonna, like, overstate that. But, like, there's a milder form when you search something, that's, this has been like pretty documented, right? When you search something, what happens? It's all the advertisements you get. Like, or if you buy something, then all of a sudden you'll have it advertised to you. It's weird what people, what, what, what things people will do that for. Like, uh, uh, like I bought a tea egg. Do you know people know what a tea egg is? When you use loose leaf tea, you have to buy a thing to put it in. Oh, it's like a tea bag. It's metal. Um, anyways, I bought a tea egg, and then like I got advertisements for tea eggs for like a year. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, why do I need a tea egg? I just bought a tea egg. Um, anyways, um, yeah. So they're con we're constantly and some of you like uh, like what other sort of things do people know about when it comes to being watched on? Uh, via your technology, via the internet. Yeah. I don't know how true this is, but I've been told that sometimes, especially with like Apple products, they might be able to turn on the camera on your phone or laptop and just view you or watch you without you even noticing. I don't know if that's true either. What else? I know one thing that they use. What, what does our phone do? Do for us. Location. Yeah, I know that it's it's pretty well documented that uh, various apps, as well as the phone company themselves, they track your location and they use it. They use it as part of a data analysis to understand once again your behaviors and how to market things, right? Products to people. It's usually product driven, right? Uh, in fact, like in the United States. Dealing with the massive amount of data produced by our various technological engagements to generate money is probably one of the fastest growing industries. It's a huge industry, right? Now, you guys have probably even heard of big data as a phrase, right? Because I think it's in popular consciousness. So, okay, we're going to pick up on surveillance. Our attitudes is what this article is going to be interested in about surveillance. So, 